So, continuing with the design styles, uh, means in the last lecture we had looked at FPGAs. So, how they work, what it is, and in this lecture, in the part two of this VLSI design style, this sub subtopic. So, we shall be looking at some other design styles. To start with, we shall be looking at gate arrays. Gate array is slightly different from FPGAs in the sense that it comes a little after FPGA. You see, let us come back to FPGA and see what it was. FPGA was some kind of a design facility that is provided to us using which you can create a design very fast, but the downsize was that all logic you recall was implemented using LUTs which are nothing but static memories in between. Okay. The LUTs are implemented using SRAMs. So, naturally they cannot be as fast as some logic implemented using logic gates. So, FPGAs will be slower in terms of the speed of operation. Now, now here when you are talking about uh, the second technology called gate arrays or GA, gate array will be little less flexible than FPGA, but its speed will be a little higher. So, these are all design performance trade offs. Okay. So, in that sense we say that in terms of the speed of prototyping, gate array comes after the FPGA in term in the sense that it is slightly slower. The main difference is that to implement a design on the hardware for FPGA, uh, you can do it in your lab, so, you can do it with user programming. So, if you have the CAD tool available with you, you can do it yourself, but gate arrays cannot be done in that way. You have to send your information or your request to the fabrication facility to get it done. But you may ask the question that well, if I have to send it to the fabrication facility, then what is the advantage of having this gate array, why do not we design and develop a more conventional ASIC a chip and send it to the fabrication facility. Now, we shall see the basic principle of gate array, the way it works, the way it is created, the total cost becomes much less as compared to a complete designing an IC from scratch kind of a philosophy. Let us see how it happens. Gate array requires a two step manufacturing process. This is very important. The two steps are like the first step is design independent and the second step is more like customization this is design dependent. Like I will come to this. So, what I mean to say is that suppose there are five uh, say people organizations or customers, there are five customers who want to manufacture their designs using GAs or gate arrays. So, manufacturing process as I said comprises of two steps. The first one is independent of the design. So, the cost of the first step can be shared by these five customers. Okay. So, the per customer cost becomes much less and in fact, this first step of fabrication is the more complex step or the more expensive step which is shared in terms of cost. But once this first step is done, in the second step we take the specific request from the customers and we customize our IC or chip according to the request by the customers. So, the second step will be on a per customer basis that will be specific to the customers. So, as you can see your cost component gets divided or reduced. So, again coming back to this slide, the first phase is 
based on something called generic masks. The first phase is called generic masks means we use a set of masks during fabrication using which you create some transistors on the chip large number millions of transistors, but the transistors are not interconnected you are not interconnecting them just fabricating the transistors in an isolation in an isolated way. In the second part where you have a design to be implemented you actually complete the interconnections to create your designs right. This is the basic idea. So, the first step you create a large number of transistors which are not connected. In the second step you, you complete the connection interconnection of the transistor depending on the designs that have been provided. Okay. So, diagrammatically I am just very briefly showing like this. This is the first step where you create a large number of transistors. Now, this transistor when you are creating these are sometimes called deep processing steps, because you have to create a number of layers starting from the oxide layer diffusion polysilicon ox then again and uh, just by the gate you need an isolation. So, a number of layers of fabrication are required which increases the cost of this step. Okay. So, for this step you use a set of standard masks which will be same for all the designs and you create the wafers a large number of wafers which are common they can be used by any customer. Now, in the second step you take this specific request from the customers you create the custom masks and you only create the metallizations you only fabricate the metal layers on top of the transistors that you have already created in order to complete the interconnections right. So, this is how this two step manufacturing works. So, obviously, uh, for a gate array the chip utilization is higher because in G A you have transistors and the transistors you can utilize in any way you can. But in FPGA you recall inside the CLBs you have lot of unnecessary things you always do not need there are so many multiplexers flip flops you often do not need means all of them many of them right. But in GA it is not like that you can use any transistor when you need and obviously chip speed is higher because you are not using any static RAM anywhere it is only the transistors which are connected a typical gate array chips can be pretty large in size fine. Okay. Now, let us come to a design style which is perhaps the most widely used today when we talk about creating the ICs. So, the standard cell design is one of the most prevalent design style in one sense you see to tackle and handle the modern day complexity no one designs the chips from scratch there is a concept of design reuse. So, now people talk about creating something called a technology library where some of the small standard designs I have already created in a very efficient way I have created a very compact layout for them and have stored them in the library. Let us say for example, a 3 input NAND gate. So, in my design whenever I need a 3 input NAND I simply pick it up from the library I put it in my layout. I need a 4 input NAND I again pick up from the library I put it in my design. This is the concept behind this so called semi custom design style. So, standard cell or semi custom design style this is a design style where all the masks have to be created because the cost of fabrication has to be borne by you only. So, so means you are a designer you want to fabricate. So, the entire cost of fabrication have to be borne by you. So, basic idea as I mentioned you develop the commonly used logic cells and store them in a 
so called cell library. The typical cell library can contain a few hundred cells, some of them are shown, some they are the basic gates, multiplexers, flip flops, say, say a full adder, this kind of simple blocks are stored in the cell library in terms of you can say highly optimized layouts. There are some constraint we shall be talking about. So, this is the basic idea, but as I said there are some constraints regarding the cells. Each cell must have the same height, all the cells their heights must be same fixed height. Why? If the cells have fixed heights, you can put them side by side and join them together, this is the advantage. The cells have the same height with your VDD and ground lines running in the same you can say same horizontal configuration, so that if you put them side by side, the VDD and ground lines will also join, right. This is one advantage or one feature. So, this allows automated placement of the cells along rows and interconnection. So, so as I said number of cells can be put side by side abutted to form rows. The power and ground rails typically run parallel to upper and lower boundary of the cells. Neighboring cells share common power and ground bus and input and output pins are located on the upper and lower boundary of the cell. So, what I mean to say is that let me just show you once, suppose this is one standard cell, I am just showing the layout as a box, let us say this corresponds to a two input NAND. Okay. So, there will be some vertical lines that will represent the two inputs A and B and there will be another vertical line that will represent the output let us say f. Not only that as I said there will be one fixed track for the power supply V D D and another fixed track for ground. So, if you look at some other standard cell maybe some other functionality. So, this will also look very similar and the V D D and ground lines will be running similarly in the exact same horizontal positions. So, that if you put them side by side bring them closer together this V D D and ground lines will touch each other, this is the main advantage. So, you can actually put all these standard cells side by side if you require in rows, so then V D D and ground lines will automatically touch each other, so they will get their power connections from there, right. So, here some example is shown, this is the layout diagram of a two input NAND followed by a NOT inverter, this is the CMOS design of a two input NAND this red lines are the polysilicon lines which feed the inputs A and B and this red line here is the input of this NOT gate which is taken from the output of this first NAND gate and the output of this is available on this vertical line F. So, this is the example of a cell where a NAND gate and an, an inverter are connected one after the other. So, the standard cells as I said can be of fixed height, but depending on their complexity can be of varying widths and they connect at VDD and ground, they connect together right. Now, when you talk about the floor planning for standard cell designs, so just inside the IO frame, what I mean to say is that you have the total chip area with you. So, the standard cells can be connected side by side. So, you can easily connect them in a number of rows, okay. 
there will be number of rows in which the standard cells can be placed and there will be some space in between which can be used for their interconnections. Let us see how I have a diagram here. This diagram shows one row of the standard cell cells, this is a second row, this is a third row and some interconnections are shown like this. See when you do interconnections as you can see these are shown as two different colors which means the horizontal and vertical lines are on two different layers. So, when you want to connect them you run a part on one layer, a part on other layer so that means another connection that is going side by side does not intersect. So, you see here you have one connection from here to here and there is another connection from here to here, but here there is no interconnect, no cross connection because they are running on two different layers blue and purple right. And just another thing you see you have the standard cells like this and the space in between which is there you are leaving it for interconnections or routing. So, here one thing is true that if you do it in this way there may be a situation where you need to connect a point from here to a connect uh, say we say here some point here, let us say you want to connect here to here. So, how do you connect? Because you see let me just show it here. So, what I mean to say is that you have one row of cells here, you have one row of cells here, you have one row of cells here. So, the cells you are placing here one by one, here also you are placing the cells, here also you are placing the cells. Now, suppose I need to connect a point here to a point here. So, how do I connect? I do not have any path to take from here to here. I have a path to take from here to here or here to here, right. So, what I do in this case is that I use some special standard cells which are called feed through cells feed through cells are nothing just they support a vertical connection nothing else no logic. So, if you want to make this connection what you do, so I am just showing using two different colors. So, you make a connection like this then from here you make another connection like this. right. These are called feed through cells. So, so, here whenever required you can include this feed through cells in your design in your cells, so that you can take some wires from the top to bottom or bottom to top as required. So, let us look at a more complex design how a standard cell layout typically looks like. So, you can see that there are cells placed here, cells placed here, cells placed here and the space in between this is called a channel, this channel is used for interconnections. You see red and this pink wires are shown on two different layers, they are used for interconnection. So, this is how a standard cell layout works. You see the reason we are discussing the design styles now will have a big impact on our subsequent discussion. Like you see the, the first thing relating to physical design for VLSI circuits that we will see is a process called floor planning and placement. Placement means given a block where in the chip I have to place the block. You see if you are following the standard cell design style then your choice is very limited. You already have the rows defined, you can place a block in one of the rows, but you if you 
do not have any such restriction, then you can place the block anywhere on the chip on any coordinate that is much more unrestricted and obviously, it will be more complex. So, it really depends on the design style whether you need to spend lot of time in certain steps or you do not need that at all. In standard cell floor planning is not required only placement placing something floor planning means approximately where I will place it on the silicon floor that is floor planning. Okay. All right. So, this is how a standard cell layout looks like. So, now let us come to the extreme full custom design. So, here we are more saying that we want to design everything from scratch, but as I said in practice today very rarely we do that because of the very high cost and time involved for that. But anyway full custom may mean means unrestricted I can place anything anywhere on the chip, but I am not saying that I am developing everything from scratch. Maybe for example, I need let us say I need a multiplier as part of my design, but already you have designed a multiplier I can take it from you take the design from you I can put that same design in my design. Okay. I can reuse the designs in this way. So, people normally create their VLSI chips today in this fashion. Okay. So, standard cell based design as I said they are called semi custom design because the cells are pre-designed the gates the multiplexers the flip flops they are of same heights and they are all pre-designed. But in full custom design, we are saying that we may not have any library at all. So, we may have to design all the blocks ourselves, we may have to place them in whatever location we want, we have entire flexibility, but obviously for this entire flexibility to happen the development cost can be prohibitively high. You think of the fact that modern day VLSI chips can contain more than a billion transistors, doing it or handling it in a full custom way is almost next to impossible, because it will take you years to create a design to complete your design to complete your layout. Okay. So, this will become too complicated for you. So, as I said I am emphasizing design reuse is becoming a very important thing. So, whenever you have a design which was already done by some earlier designer, you will always try to reuse it in order to save time, okay. but there are something which was not there you will have to design it from scratch anyway. Okay. Fine. So, so, one classical example where full custom design is used very religiously and rigorously is in the design of a memory cell, because memory is one kind of a chip where we try to pack maximum amount of cells or bits inside a chip. So, very compact and optimized layout is of extreme importance and one advantage of memory is that because it is created as an array once you create the layout of, of a cell you can replicate it large number of times. So, it is not that you are creating the layout of the whole chip from scratch, you are designing the layout of a cell you are replicating it many times million number of times billion number of times like that. Okay. So, uh, for memory cell you can actually go for this, but for logic chip design as I said. So, you can use a combination of various design styles and also you can use design, uh, design reuse. Logic cell you can use some part you can use standard cell some part you can use using design reuse you can include a block like that. So, this is a this, this is a typical figure which will tell you why this this concept of full custom design will not work well. 
because in real full custom design, so where means everything is flexible, the geometry, the shapes, orientation, the angle of rotation, placement, where they are placed, placed of every transistor of every circuit block can be done individually. The design productivity can be extremely low. So, this was the average figure which is quoted 10 to 20 transistors per day per designer. Okay. So, for large designs it may not be practically feasible to go for this kind of full custom design. So, you see uh, when you design some chips which you expect to sell in millions, for example, the processor chips which Intel manufactures, the Pentiums, the multi core chips, CPU chips, there they can afford to spend lot more time and effort in order to create a chip which is much better, much faster, much optimized. But in other cases, where you are expected to sell 1000 or 10,000 of the chips in the market. So, doing or going through that exercise is not means worth the, the pain or the effort. right? So, as I said in digital VLSI design, full custom design is very rarely used. Exceptions as I mentioned are the design of high volume products such as high performance microprocessors which are expected to be sold in plenty, memory chips and of course, FPGA chips which are also sold in very large numbers. It is here where some kind of full custom design or some judicious combination of full custom and semi custom can be used. So, a typical full custom layout can look like this. So, you see you have different blocks of various shapes and sizes, some are rectangular, some are long, some are thin. So, here as you can see you, he means here you cannot follow the standard cell kind of design principle, you will have to place these blocks individually on the silicon floor. So, after placing you will have to interconnect them in a suitable way. So, the entire principle, the entire philosophy of design here is different, you have to do it in a different way, right. So, in order to make a quick comparison among the design styles, so we are comparing FPGA, gate array, standard cell and full custom against these parameters. Cell size, for an FPGA we have the CLBs, they are fixed for a gate array they are the transistors or the gates which are fixed. Standard cell, cell size can vary, but the heights are fixed, but for full custom it is entirely variable, it is entirely flexible. Cell type, for FPGA you have the CLBs which can be programmed, for gate array it is transistor or gate which is fixed, for standard cell you can put in any cell from the library full custom also you can put anything variable. Cell placement, FPGA gate arrays you do not have any choice, they are already prefabricated, they are fixed. In standard cell, you can place the cells only in rows, but in full custom you can place them anywhere. For interconnects, FPGAs they are programmable switch matrix which you can program gate array you have to complete the interconnection, this is variable, standard cell full custom they are also variable. And obviously, design time wise FPGA is the fastest, it can take minutes to an hour maybe in the lab, gate array is relatively fast, standard cell is medium, full custom is slow. See medium means you need a turnaround time of 6 months to 12 months that is what we call as medium, but full custom complete design will require much more time. Okay. So, with this we come to the end of uh, the fourth lecture, now in the next two lectures we shall be looking at some brief overview uh, means on about the different steps in the VLSI physical design cycle, which we will be covering in the next modules in this course. Thank you.